courses are doing really good right now. It's, um, you know, back a couple, a couple, even you could even argue like last year, but like, you know, the longer the course and the more involvement per week, the, the, the drop off tends to, to happen. And so we're trying to find, there's no necessarily optimal length, but, um, you know, between the 30 day and 60 day is usually pretty good as far as like a course goes online to keep interest and to move people along. And it doesn't, does matter on what the result is. If it's, purely info driven, like how to, um, you know, copy my method and we'll support you in doing that. You know, a short course that really teaches that is great. And then hopefully you're getting the students that results. Um, a membership site to me is a little, it's, it, it really adds the element of community. And to me, it adds the element of accountability ongoing. Um, and in many cases it's, you're learning a little bit here and there, but it's not this like direct, path. Um, now without getting into Stu's whole course, but like there's definitely different types of memberships, but if you're teaching a membership that is around mastery, which is what Stu calls it of, of they're trying to learn a subject, um, you know, you're spreading it out and the lower price point, um, makes people okay with that, right? Like, oh, if it's only 50 bucks a month or a hundred bucks a month and you teach me one or two very powerful trainings and then I get access, access to you or your team and some templates, that feels really good. But it's not about this, like, I'm going to help you create a course. Um, because, you know, a beta process for us isn't ongoing forever, right? So you're trying to think about the longevity of a membership site. Like, what stage of what you teach is something that's just ongoing support. And if your industry changes a lot and people have to keep up with trends, um, those make for really great membership sites because, um, for example, like Facebook ads, there's a lot of people now creating Facebook yeah. ad membership sites and they weren't really thinking about that a year or so ago. It was just like, oh, learn Facebook. Okay, go. Facebook is changing things pretty much every day. I mean, you wake up, the algorithm is different. They have different buttons for some people and they're testing yeah. stuff out. So why wouldn't you want to pay access 20, 30, 40 bucks a month to someone who's keeping uh, like attention, paying attention to that, telling you how it impacts yeah. your business? That sounds great versus buying a thousand dollar course every time it changes. That makes no sense. Yeah. So I think it's about I think Stu talks about it as like, oh, like smell the flowers, you're walking on the sidewalk versus like driving in a car from point A to point B. So um, now there's no like perfect way to determine that. But I think about if the result the student needs is quick and I'm teaching them info and they need to just go do it, then that's a course. The membership is ongoing support, helping people get to the next level. The thing that's a little less tangible tends to be the, the, the membership. Plus it really is about the community and people just wanting to be hanging out with other people that are in it. Um, and that ten, lends really well to a membership um, site as well. I think it was one of the really interesting things for me going through um, and sort of trying to pay attention to what was going on in, in Tribe, this mm. thing about the expectation about the amount of information that actually creates the overwhelm that becomes the number yes. one reason that people leave memberships. Yep. That yep. People actually are ready and willing to take information on, on a period of pace, mm -hmm. slower, slower pace, typically that I guess yep. than people naturally assume would be the case. Yeah. And I, I, I think, think that has been really interesting to watch that. For sure. And from a teaching perspective, um, this is why this is messed up. In, in entrepreneurship, where it's about like money and transactions in many cases, it's like, oh, well, if it's only $30, let me blow them away. Let me just throw everything I've ever taught because why wouldn't someone want it for $30? And it's like, they want, they still want an outcome. And what you're doing is actually making it harder for them to get their outcome. And to me, what I saw a lot of before the stew days and before he's really making an impact on membership sites specifically is our value as a teacher being tied to how many videos are there, how many worksheets. And that's not true. It's, it's all about yeah. the transformation and the result. And that can apply to a course too. And so what we do is we think, oh, if I get, you know, uh, HD videos and it's all this like it's beautifully shot and I like a b-roll and all that stuff then my course is worth two thousand dollars it's like your course is worth the result that you get them yes a nice looking course is awesome but guys please don't make that like your goal the first time you're teaching yeah. it and that that's where we started to go it's not just 
how well put together it is. The value is actually what I know. And I think that's our own like dealings with our own self-worth, right? And back to your point about the up and down months, you know, this has been a huge thing for me as someone who, you know, again, tried to get that stable income and have the healthcare and all that, and then transition to not that, you know, my worth tied to a bank account is not some, that's something that I didn't realize was a problem until it went up and down. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm a bad person or I suck at this. And so when the work was coming through me and I was charging, you know, my value, which is a whole other conversation, when it's not looking good in your bank account, you actually internalize like that. And that is not a great space to create from. And so how how much we can stabilize that really actually impacts like how well we can run our business. And that's where that comes in. But I think our, our worth being tied to the knowledge we're putting out there and whether or not people are going to buy it. Like that was the biggest fear in the, in the beta yeah. course, right? When I asked you guys, what are you worried about? And it was like, what if no one buys it? And it, it's because that literally tells you like, no one likes what you do or no one trusts you and your knowledge or you don't know anything. I mean, you could add any negative thing about what happens if no one wants to learn from you. And it's very like intimate that, that feeling and our, and so I think, um, from the profit perspective, as much as we can protect our confidence, um, that's a big, a big thread in this up and down thing. But it's also don't throw the kitchen sink at it because then it's more valuable. Like, no, you're, you're already worthy no matter what. And so are your students. So give them what they need to, to, to get to what you promise them. This is, I mean, this is interesting. You've used the word outcome uh, mm. within that as well. So I'm, I'm intrigued if you could sort of share with us this, this idea or the notion of, of what creates a win-win scenario, yeah. both for the student and the entrepreneur. Because I, I sort of have in my mind this idea, which is, which is similar to, I think, to, to what you've really just been saying there. The expectation is that the student, we naturally presume, will want everything we've got. Because we why wouldn't yeah. they want it? Because we think it's magnificent. Mm. But at the same time, we have this sort of inner entrepreneurial conflict that also says, hold on a minute, I'm trying to do this to create a layer of income that if I can possibly create, as you mentioned, that evergreen scenario, mm. turn it on, it happens in the background, the PayPal notifications keep coming through, the world's a lovely place, <laughs> but it's not really like that ah, all the yeah. time. Mm-hmm. So we have this thing where I think from an entrepreneurial perspective, we're thinking about how do I get the most in actually with the least amount of effort? And the student's yeah. thinking, or we believe the student wants everything, but actually they don't. How it's can too I squeeze much. everything out yeah. of what I bought? So we sort yeah. of have this slight... Um, mm-hmm. Sort of um, adversarial, mismatch. like yeah, yeah, totally. Like it's automatically against each other. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a great point, and I think it comes to that transparency and naming it as such. Um, I think doing that first is huge. That that is the hypocrisy of it. I remember first coming into this space being like, so wait, everyone hates all the courses that suck, but then they're all turning around trying to create the next course and they think there's too many and they buy too many. And then they're wanting to actually put their own shit out there. Right. <laughs> so for me, I, it's like, oh yeah, wait, if we like actually zoom out and look at what's happening, like what, you know, I think it's, it's more about the transformation and not the transaction that yes, a lot happens in that transaction of me giving you money uh, to take me on a journey. And I think the way the win-win piece that you brought up too, as, as it relates to this is going, okay, cool. Here are the expectations for this course and what I can promise you. Um, here's the effort you have to put in as the entrepreneur, or as the student. Um, and then here's like what, you know, is not possible or like is, you know, whatever. And I think really naming it. So the student is fully aware and there's almost something disruptive by just naming that like pointing out the trend of like oh wow isn't that weird that we've created this space that is that like everyone wants to be on a beach somewhere sipping coconut juice or whatever coconut water while money is coming in four day work week right a la four day work week yeah. and then but then at the same time um, our students, like we're also our, so that's the other part. We're both the teacher yeah. and the seller of products and the student of them. And I tried to bring that up a lot in the beta program was like, 
feel how you feel as a student and how, like, what do you want to transfer to your students when you're teaching? Like, what do you not like about the way the course creator shows up? What felt like inauthentic or what felt yeah. like just a sales transaction? And so I think people are starting to question that model of just put something out there and hope it sticks. As long as there's, there's that acknowledgement. And I think for me, and definitely like in like the Stu world too, Stu McLaren, like it is about the community. So I can create a product that is evergreen, but I can't, I, I don't think you should hold back the community of people buying that product. So I always say, and one of the first things we do in my beta process is like, how do you want to show up for this community? Now the beta, you show up a lot more than potentially the future, but what does your involvement look like? Is it once a month Q&A? Is it, are you hiring people to help you manage the community and point them in the right direction? Are you non-existent and you're just telling your people, hey, I'm not here to help you, but guess who can help? other students. That's still yeah. more valuable than buying a program and you feeling all alone as the student that, because, yeah. because, and so I think if, if you can't show up as the teacher, how can you actually at least create pathways to them to connect with other students or coaches you train is a whole other conversation. Like there's lots of ways to, um, create that connection because I believe that learning happens in community. Um, which is why the beta is so valuable. Um, uh, and uh, I would love to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I think that that, that moment, again, the tribe piece, that community seeing how people engage in that as a yeah, group that was huge. and share <laughs> and comment is amazing mm -hmm. actually. And it is, it is a tremendous, um, advert for it as a, con as a concept. I mean, she's brilliant and, anyway, but Yeah, incredible. and what did, what did he promise? He didn't even promise this on the front end, everyone listening, by the way. Like, he promised this whole course. He said, the community is amazing. I promise you it's awesome. You get to the other side. Oh, by the way, Monday through Friday, I'm showing up at this time every day. People are blown away. Now, this is someone who yeah. had a multi-million dollar launch who runs... Um, I think he has a little under 20 employees. I'm not positive, but he has full-time employees, an office. Like, I mean, this isn't like, and he is business. showing yeah. up and being yeah. there for his community Monday through Friday. And I believe he did that for about eight weeks and he did not miss one. I think one time he missed one, there was something that happened and everyone, what are they going to do? Be so apologetic because, yeah. him, because him doing it in the first place was unheard of in this space. It was, it's always yeah. like, how do I remove myself from the course? Not how do I give everything to this community? So what did it do? It modeled for his community what it looked like to show up and they wanted to show up for each other because Stu was doing it for them. So of course it's going to create a whole different environment than um, some of these other multi-million dollar course launches that have a thousand new students, 1500 new students. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, you, you absolutely touched on it there. So beta course then is a stepping stone into yes. a bigger plan. So let's talk yes. about the value of a beta course and maybe even just a, a, a side note on an alpha piece going into a beta Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And where that fits in. Um, but the beta piece, the value of it, the, what should people expect to put mm. into that experience, given that pathway to the bigger plan? Yeah, I love this. And this is where I separate, I think, from some of the language online. So first, first of all, a lot of people have this idea that maybe beta should be free. That is like inexcusable and I think does not fit with your line of work that you do, Jason, either. Like if we're building profitable businesses, we need to be paid for the energy we put into our business. Sure. Okay. <laughs> sure. So let's like put that out on the table. So beta should never be free because not only that, the student isn't capable to show up and invest in you and your course. You obviously care more about it than they do for so many reasons. Um, and, and by you making it free that you're just basically allowing them to basically not care at all unless they want their tra transformation, which they're not even positive they're going to get because they don't have yeah. anything on the line. But then the next step, though, that is common in this online space now is to charge less than what you're planning on charging in the future. Now, 
I like to add a little disclaimer that, yeah, it might be true that you charge less than what you're going to charge in the future, but I want to even give the proposition that you might actually even charge more than what you're planning on charging in the future. And that's because of your involvement. So another, one of my first questions I ask in the beta planning process is how involved you want to be and what is your exchange of energy for that involvement? 